You're listening to the 2018 Nelson Arts Festival Page and Blackmore Readers and Writers Program. This Thinking Brunch, Parenting in the Digital Age, features Steve Henry, Anne Harvey, Emily Wrights and John Parsons in conversation with Matt Laurie. Become ensnared by predatory adults across digital networks, those who have been cyber abused, and children and youth who abuse others using online technologies. Give it up for John Parsons. And next to John, we have Anne Harvey. Anne is the author of Sons to Men, A Mother's Guide. She was a businesswoman raising four boys when she realized the management skills she utilized in her business were readily applicable at home as her boisterous boys became tumultuous teenagers. She now works part-time at NMIT here in Nelson as an engagement liaison, and she mentors mothers of sons. Please give a warm welcome to Anne Harvey. And on the other side of me, I have Emily Wrights. Emily is a young mother of two small boys. Her first blog post about parenting went viral in March 2015, reaching more than one million people in a few days. Emily has been the parenting columnist for the New Zealand Herald and the New Zealand Women's Weekly, and has also written for Metro Magazine. She is currently-ish the editor of uh, Spin-Off Parents. She also runs the Lighthouse Events for Mothers and has a popular podcast called Dear Mamas. Um, she's the author of two books, Rants in the Dark, you might be able to see it here, uh, which has been turned into a play. Uh, and is it bedtime yet? Emily lives in Wellington. She's come all the way to Nelson, especially for this event. Give a warm welcome to Emily Wrights. And our other panellist is Steve Henry. Steve is a father of two sons. They, at the time I was given this, they were 17 and 18. Is that still their ages? They are 17 and 18, one of whom is on the autistic spectrum. Steve has observed that his son finds it easier to develop connections with others in the digital world than face to face. He's also witnessed how a Canadian homeschool used Minecraft, the game, to build trust and other leadership opportunities which have been highly effective for kids who are socially challenged. Steve facilitates graduate level leadership for change programs for Otago Polytechnic and is based in Motueka, and he has done a TED Talk. Please give a warm welcome to Steve Henry. And me, I'm Matt Laurie. I am a second term Nelson City Councillor. Uh, and I'm the Green Party spokesperson for Nelson. I was the Green Party candidate at last year's election. Uh, and I write a cartoon called The Little Things. There's a couple of books up here, which started in Nelson. It's sort of the, the sort of idea was sort of spawned just at Founders one Friday night. So it's a little Nelson story. And it's very nice to be invited to chair this session. Okay, so we're going to start. Oh, thanks. Yeah, give me a round of applause. Thank you. I don't want to feel left out. Okay, so let's let's kick off with um, kind of what the experts. What do the experts say? And we're going to start with you, John. What do the experts say about children and the digital world? Like, how, when is it okay for kids to start getting online? Um, I, before I'll answer it, we need to um, think about a child progressing from the day that they're born, they're in a living room, in a living space, and then moving forward up to the age of 18. But your question's quite broad, but I'll answer it like this. One of the questions I get asked a lot from parents is, at what age should you introduce a child to technology? A parent introduces a child to technology the minute they see them using it. Uh, we think of, um, you know, expo it's exposure to technology. So they start seeing that technology when mom and dad use that technology. And then from, from about zero to two, there should be no use of technology uh, by the child at all. From three to five, this is the American Pediatrics Association. Now they're saying this from their research. From age three to five, an absolute maximum of about one hour a day, as long as an adult is involved in that experience of using that technology. And then from five and above, generally speaking, no more than two hours of recreational use. That's on top of their use of technology within the school system. And, and what's the logic? I mean, what happens if kids don't uh, follow those guidelines or parents don't follow those guidelines. What happens to the kids? That question, you need about three months and a lot more <laughs> research to answer that in its entirety. Um, what I'll say to you is this, it's really easy to draw a, a, a narrow line and say that 
because Tommy wasn't, didn't do this at seven or eight, this is the consequence at 18. We can't think like that. There are so many complexities to raising a child. And um, what I can tell you is this. What I will say is this, that rather than look at screen time, which is where everybody gravitates towards, look at the exclusion of opportunity. So if I'm asked to work with a family where a, child, a complaint has been made by the adult, and generally it's the adult that complains about a child's use, not a child, a child doesn't complain about an adult, and that needs to change. We live in a hierarchy where the power sits at the top, where the adults sit, the, the wisdom, the knowledge, which is absurd, because we need to start listening to children and what they need from mom and dad, not just what we think they need to do as children. They're not the children of the 60s. They live in 2018 today, which is a completely different world where they're saturated with information. But what I can tell you is this. If you raise a child with love and compassion, it will affect how they drive a car at 18 or use a cell phone at age 12. Love, compassion, kindness, decency. Those are the things that they need to be marinated in. But I will say this to you to become more specific. I work in schools across New Zealand. I've seen hundreds of thousands of students in my work. Um, one of the things that I see a lot of is this. Young people, um, seven and eight and nine years of age, expressing sexualized, antisocial behavior. When I sit down and talk to them and to their mom and dads, what I often see is exposure to R18 games like Grand Theft Auto. At six and seven years of age, where you can sexually violate another player or avatar, typically female, language that is diabolical where you can maim or you can maim and torture someone if we marinate children at six and seven years of age in r18 games then what do we think we're going to get back at 18 that's the issue but the te it isn't a technological problem it's a relational issue that we've got to deal with i asked 100 parents 100 students i'm sorry 12 year olds 12 year olds if mom and dad put the device down what would you like to do with them not one of them said re-engage technology they all said, sit together, have a hug, do something. We've got to stop obsessing about the technology as well. We have to not think about technology as the demon because it isn't. Technology is neutral. If we take control of it and acclimate it into our daily lives, everything's fine. But if it overtakes us, we exclude other opportunities to build relationships with our children. So, um, Emily, torture sounds bad. I don't think torture is good. But I do know that iPads are really good for keeping kids busy when you've got stuff to do. <laughs> what are your thoughts on this? Oh, well, you know, my kids have had no screen time, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a lie. My kids have had a lot of screen time. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love what you said, and I especially love what you said about listening to children because I do think that you know, um, as a society, we don't value the opinions of children and we don't make society a place for children that is that welcoming anymore, not compared to what I've heard it is in other countries and what um, other generations of parents have told me about what it's like. So I think, you know, it's very, I didn't hear this from you at all. I didn't feel like you were demonising mothers, but I do see a lot in the media about demonising mothers about the use of screen time. And it is a gendered thing. I very rarely hear fathers. Nobody seems to care if fathers are on their phones. Um, but I often- They're working. They're doing important man yeah, stuff. Yeah, they're doing very important man <laughs> stuff. So, um, but, you know, I often will see the same articles, you know, um, if mothers, um, are always on their phone and, and as a consequence children are now turning into swarms of bees and stuff like that and I just get so tired of hearing that because one of the reasons why mothers are often on their phones in this generation is because outside the door has become quite a scary place for mothers. Going to a cafe is difficult because you're getting um, you know, you're having all these cafes where the new cool things to exclude mothers and buggies and all that. And then if a child makes a noise, it's like, get the evil mother out, burn her at the stake. Wow. And, you know... This is, this is in Wellington? Yeah, it's very it's common. Town's changed. Very common. Okay. So um, they have the stocks outside most cafes now. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, I think that it's really isolating now as a mother... Um, because, you know, I appreciate being called a young mother, but I'm not that young. But um, the 
I think now mothers, are, they're getting more um, judgment than ever before, more um, information thrown at them. It's really confusing time. You're told your child needs to know how to use an iPad, but they can't ever use an iPad, God forbid. And they, you know, they should be um, not ever watching TV, but how do you watch TV and then have this hypocritical idea that you're allowed to unwind at the end of the day, but your child's never allowed to have any downtime in front of a TV. And they need to be out in nature, but God forbid, never around any childless people, lest they might upset them with their laughter and joy. And, <laughs> you know, like this, it just is a real minefield. And I've, got, and I've got mothers in my community who are contacting me, and right from when they're pregnant, they're terrified because they're being told, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that, and then this is going to be terrible. And their whole, they're going into giving birth, going, oh, I hope I don't need an epidural because then I will have failed already. And, you know, we need to address the way society treats mothers and how friendly um, society is to children before we start going into, um, oh, well, mums just need to have, be on the phone less, you know. Mm -hmm. There. I think they the judgment thing is, is true also for men, and, and maybe I'm just a little bit sensitive, but uh, recently we had a plumber come to our house, Darcy, you remember this? And the kids said, school holidays, and the kids said, hey, can we have screen time? And I went, yeah, you can have screen time after the plumbers come. And I was kind of surprised that uh, the kids didn't say, well, what difference does it make whether there's a plumber here? But for me, funnily enough, I didn't know who the plumber was going to be. And I didn't like the idea of someone that I didn't know coming to the house, school holidays, sees me, Nelson City Council, sitting around reading the newspaper while my kids are on devices. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, that's not a good look. I'm not going to win any votes with that. <laughs> so, so I said to the boys, I tell you what, why don't you just wait until after the plumber's gone? And that's what we did. And I, I thought this is pretty strange that I'm doing this, but that's how I feel about it too. So it's, I think, across the board. Steve, what are your thoughts on this? Like, you've got a, a more sort of relaxed attitude, I think, from what I've read uh, to technology. Do, do you worry about it a lot in terms of kids? Oh, I don't know about worry. I think there's bigger things to worry about, personally. And I, I come back to the connection piece. I think it's all about um, relationships and quality and honesty. If it's um, alongside other stuff, fantastic. But if it's at the exclusion, then there's a big problem. Yeah. So yeah, my, my sons are quite unique. And one of the things, I mean, I'll pick my 17-year-old. He's never been invited to someone else's house. So there you go. So get your head around that. So he's, um, but he's very happy. That's one of the traits of autism, if you don't know it, is um, he's very content in his own world. Now, he will interact with people hugely. He went to the school formal in Motueka a couple of weeks ago, which was an amazing achievement, right? And it was remarkable that he even went. Now that happened because of Instagram and the fact that he was included and is able to share and, but sit him down one-on-one, -on -one, he's terrified. So, so it's very interesting. And I, my observation is that there's a lot more people who are socially challenged than we give credit to. I, I don't think that's, you know, I think, I mean, the numbers suggest 75,000 people in New Zealand are on the autism spectrum of some kind, but I, I kind of have a sense that not everyone's socially onto it, and phones are an excuse for, f or whatever, technology's become a, a mechanism to feel comfortable. Well, what, what do you say to people who suggest that one of the reasons people are less socially skilled is because they spend too much time on devices and not interacting with people person to person? Well, I would argue that um, they probably need to look at how socially aware they are. Mm. Okay. People who make judgments like that just aren't very well informed. Okay, personal, I had an experience recently. I was hanging out with some millennials because I'm that kind of guy. I'm like into everybody, I hang out with everybody. And it was like, I've been doing some work with these guys and they were really cool. And and we finished the, the, the bit of work we had to do and then we went to the free house to, to chill out and sort of debrief. And I had this massive phone in my face, like, and I was looking at the back of this massive phone the whole time with this person. And I just thought, I'm actually sick of this. And I didn't say, hey, do you mind putting the phone down? I'm trying to have a conversation with you. I just said, I've got some friends outside. It's been great. See you later. And they looked at me like, oh, he's upset about something. And I didn't really want to get into it. But I, as maybe it's a generational thing. And maybe it's a generational thing where you're not being authentic, mm. actually. How, so it would have been, for me to be authentic, I would have said, I'd have had to say, hey, 
He phones bother I'd like me. to connect with you. Mm. Can, yeah. can I play too? Okay. Also, the, uh, I didn't want to distract her. Just one other thing to say, and I talk about these hierarchies where the power sits at the top. Mm. You, you call them millennials, which is a label. So that creates a separation instantly. And what that allows you to do then is judge their behaviour, but not think of your own. I'm just terrible. Yeah, okay. So, so, so no, I, I, don't, I don't mean Good. that. I don't, well, I do mean it. But what I'm saying is that... You're being we, genuine. I like what it. We need, what we need, to, we need to just think about observing that situation. If you could look into a wider setting, and I could see you and the millennial, mm. right? What you'd often see in the background there is adults plugged into their devices. I can take you into most airports in this country where I spend a lot of time. John. And, and I see young people continually looking at their mom and dad's use of technology because they're plugged into it, but they don't have a voice. One of the biggest criticisms I get in schools today from teenagers is this. No one's give us a voice. No one's give us the authority to speak in this world, but that is changing. And what you're going to see in the next few years is the average age of politicians crash to 30 to 40 because when these uh, young people start to vote, they're going to cause a change through social media. Well, I hope they vote. That would be fantastic. I, I and really I just want to love in, that uh, because I... I, I just I, want to bring in yeah. here I'm if that's okay. Got another so, so how old are your boys now? <laughs> oh, 32, 31, 30 and 22. Okay. So do you think parenting would have been easier <laughs> easier with if, you were, if, they, if they were little now or, you know... Oh, okay. Well, it's, 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 I don't see it any different. Parenting's challenging no matter what, when you are. Mm. My mother found it hard. Her mother found it hard. We all find it challenging. Yep. So I think for me, I obviously missed the memo because I didn't bring my book. But interestingly enough, it sells on... You can a, have one of mine. E, e, an e-book sells more than the... So in my book, I talked about the kitchen being like your own laboratory. It's like a laboratory because that's where so many interactions happen in the family, in the kitchen. And, and so I think from what everyone, like love and compassion and, and what, with your son, you know, that, that, those stories just bring tears to my eyes to hear that technology has enabled your son to experience life in that way and to feel good about himself and to feel happy. Technology has the power to do that. It also has the power to um, do a whole lot of other things that you can talk about. But um, I think it comes down to, and we had a wee disagreement over <laughs> this earlier, our choice in the moment, right in that moment, how are you going to show love and compassion? When, when you've just got home from work, you're absolutely exhausted, and your boys, one of them's on, on the device, another one's doing something else, another one's smashing something else. That was my experience. Another one's out, out drinking. How, how can I show love and compassion? How can I do that and, and be that if I don't have those resources within myself? So, so there's a huge personal responsibility to foster love and happiness and compassion within our own self, in each moment, in your kitchen, when your children are in the kitchen, <laughs> and, uh, or when they're on their device. How do, you, how do you behave? So that's what my book's about. I think as far as technology, I have a massive mistrust of the corporations that own the... Um, technology and deliver technology so and I think there's some responsibility there that has to happen and also in a government level to make make changes yeah. but but parenting you know my brother said to me oh he had four daughters and a son and now I had the four sons <laughs> I didn't go for the fifth um <laughs> but but he said oh when, when they were expecting it. It's just like having, having that dog I had, like a puppy. I just got to train it like a puppy. I went, yeah, you're yeah, right, bro. Good luck with that. And of course, the minute his first child is born, it's this big, it's completely helpless. He was completely smitten from the moment he held her. And it's a completely different um, role to raise a human, vulnerable, gorgeous human being up into this world to be a contributing adult. We all do it different. We all cope the best way we can. And, and digital um, 
challenges are just part of the mix for, for our generation. So, Emily, do you lose sleep at all about your generation, uh, the impact brother. that uh, the technology is going to have on your kids as they grow up? Does that bother you at um, all? I thought I should say I don't disagree with any of that, just in case there was this idea <laughs> that I disagree with love and compassion for children. It's kind of my platform um, that I firmly, it's what I devote my life to that concept that children are full human beings and that we need to um, create a society that empowers them and you know treats them as they are instead of the way I feel like we're going which is closing them off um, do I lose sleep yes um, did last night did the night before have it that since the day I had my children I lose sleep and I think that um, I'm not sure I would want to be a parent who just um, doesn't worry about um, the changes the world is going to, I worry about climate change, I worry about um, everything, I'm a worrier. Um, but yeah, do I, I mean, I worry about the choices that I'm making when I'm online, um, I worry about how they'll impact my children, I worry about my use of um, social media, I worry about their screen time, I you know, I, I've never met a parent of my generation who doesn't worry. This is a new thing. We didn't come into it knowing what to do. And there is just so much judgment, this idea that me as a evil millennial um, should somehow know what to do as a parent. Like I'm meant to know how much screen time is too much or not enough or how, when am I allowed to use a phone or I'm not allowed to or, you know, none of us know what to do. Yet there's this assumption that we should know what to do. And then every sort of um, article that is out there is like um, this new study says, you know, if you were on your phone while you were pregnant, yeah. they're coming out as half octopus babies. <laughs> it's happening. Hey, um, Steve, do you would you subscribe to the idea that there should be limited time that kids can just be on screens? Because sometimes we'll go to people's places and it's just you know all access all the time. And and I think my kids kind of look at those kids and think they're so lucky. Well, do you? A little bit. So, no. Okay. So, so it depends but, what they're doing. Okay. So my son, Toby, he subscribes to 28 YouTube channels, mm -hmm. okay, and they are all around National Geographic, all around insects, all around his current interest. Yep. And he knows more about it than many. Yeah. So would I deny him that? Um, when I did search, his, search history, I did uh, find fat people having sex on YouTube, so, you know. <laughs> So, you know, he, he's, he's obviously inqui inquisitive. And I was kind of going, well, when I was 15, if that video was there, I would have been interested in looking at that, yeah. you know. So I talked about it with him. Did you, yeah. you actually spoke to him about that? Yeah, yeah I did. That's I it. spoke to him about it. Yeah. And I said, what was it like? <laughs> and we had a conversation about it. There wasn't, you're evil for looking. It's, and, and he's like, oh, you know. And it was just a, so... My view is that, um, I mean, I'm in the, I'm in the education game. Re I, I design future-focused programs, qualifications in the tertiary sector. And the reality is that the whole system is about to change. Most people don't get that. But, you know, we've had 2,000 years of these adults telling kids stuff. Well, guess what? The kids have all the information they need, thanks. I'll find it. Um, and the role, and a whole lot of things are changing. I mean, we're now... People are co-designing their curriculum, and it has to be the way, because it has to be the way. Mm. And so this is, these are massive adjustments, and the pyramid is very accurate. Don't assume if you're a parent you've got all the power, because mm. you just don't. It's a myth, in my view. You have, you have influence, okay. yeah. absolutely, yeah. but use it responsibly. Use it ethically. And how do you do that? And job? ethically. Well, just coming back to something, we talk about parenting, and we talk about it, obviously, from our own perspectives in this time slot. But I think parents of every generation had issues. I mean, what would it be like to be a parent after the First World War? What would it be like, what would it be like to parent children at six and seven years of age after the Second World War, where the only thing they'd heard was bombs and screaming? What they needed then was love, security, and compassion. You know, technology will change. The world is going to, in the next 10 years, the world is going to go through such a massive technological change you will not compare it to what's gone in the last 30 years. I guarantee you. If we got off this 
platform now, all of us, and we couldn't experience the world for the next 10 years, and all of a sudden we could come back, we wouldn't know how to interact with the things that are going to be in front of us. I guarantee you the change is going to be massive. It's going to be massive. A lot of the lower skill pay jobs are going to go away because it's going to go through full automation. There's no question. The robots are around the corner. And I don't mean the ones that walk on legs. I mean, they're going to be in everything. That change is coming. So technology continually evolves. But one of the constants the child needs is love and compassion, integrity, values, sincerity, you know, connection to the world in which they live. Those are the important things that they need. Uh, and I'm sorry, but I, that, I wanted to get that point out that um, parenting is complex, but society today has made it even more complex with the language it uses. For example, I cannot stand the word digital citizen. How dare we look at a child and label them a digital citizen? They feel less than real. Three years ago, a boy who was 10 looked at me and said, John, don't call me a digital citizen because when I look at the back of my hand, I see skin, not pixels. I'm a boy. I'm a person. And he's right. They're not digital citizens. That creates a separation between us and them in the same way that labels like millennials does. It means that if you give someone a label, you're different to them. We all bleed red. We've all got salt in our tears. And those are the things that we need to be connected through, who we are as people. So get rid of that complex language because the other thing that complex language does is this. If the minute you put, like, technology is a complex architecture, but it doesn't mean that parenting needs to be. But when you create a magazine that says digital parenting, parents go, well, I don't understand technology, so I can't parent, which is a nonsense. That's not the way we should be doing it. It's parenting in a digital age. That child is not a digital citizen. They are a citizen that uses digital technology. We relegated the person to a second position and put technology first. How dare we do that? And the reason we've got away with it is because in a hierarchy, power sits at the top where we sit. But children are coming online. And I don't mean literally online, but they're now going to have their own voice coming forward. And they will learn to speak about the world in which they live because it is so unfair at the moment. We go into schools and tell children they've got to stop bullying because bullying is bad. Come into the private sector with me. I'll show you how it gets out there. It's there. You know, a poster that says bullying is bad isn't going to stop some from bullying. Look into that child's life because they are often a victim of something. Multi-generational abuse. You know, we sold homes in the 60s, which was critical infrastructure. We sold it to the private sector. So people don't have homes to live in now. They can't afford to buy one. So they've got to rent one off someone that can buy two. Then the rent goes up. So then you get 20 people living in one home. You know, the issue is too complex to narrow it down to screen time. You know, or, or, or things like that. It, it truly is. But I'm going to come back to something very quickly again. If we raise them with love, with compassion and kindness. But remember that also involves them watching how we react to other people in the street. If we drive down the street in a car and someone cuts us up and we swear and we rant at them, then our child will learn to do the same. We're their constant teachers in their life until they take over and start looking after us. That's the goal in parenting, from the cradle to the rave. Adorn the bird with feathers so that it may fly. That's our role as a parent. One of the things I think oh, is strange. Oh, I'm in love. That's good. <laughs> That's good, but I'll tell you what, Emily wasn't in love with John about an hour ago. I wasn't. Ago. I thought he was a real judgmental prick. And ahead of this, <laughs> ahead of this, I was like, oh, why have they put me on this panel? I'm so sick of being... I nearly into... walked out. I was terrified of I this know, person. I know, I did. I, I straight up went for the throw. And because I was like, I'm going to be that bloody millennial on a panel again, being beaten up and told how bloody terrible I am about my screen time and my blah 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 and I just this is such a breath of fresh air because <laughs> it is it's about <laughs> but it's about um you know this when you talk about compassion and empathy for others it reaches to the parents as well Parents aren't born parents. They need support and help to be parents. Yet we are so aggressive and hostile towards parents. You must know what to do. You must all this stuff. And this is such a lovely message to say that one, this I've said for a long time to mothers who have been crying and suicidal about the pressures 
that they're feeling. And I've said to them, all you need to do is love your child. You don't need to be a perfect parent. You just need to be the parent that your child needs. And, but often that we don't have that same view for other parents. We have a really hostile view about other parents and we're all like, oh, did you see that mum and her kids on TV all day without thinking, has she eaten? Has, has she been able to shower today? She looks like she's not coping. But instead, it's I'll write a letter to the editor about how millennials and the way they parent and they're like, take all their children away, you know. Um, so I just really loved that. It, to me, I... It is a breath, breath of fresh air. It feels really lovely to hear that. I really love your co-papa. I'm going to just chuck a round of applause in there for you guys. Thank you. Seriously, there was it was not good. Oh, we before. were just so I was much like, better bloody now. Great. Honestly, was like, Here we go again. Sharp <laughs> objects. That, sharp objects. I made a, a, a judgment over there, uh, and it was an observation based on a question that Matt had given me, with minus some information I needed. And because I came you back. made an assumption. See, and I, fair enough. And I came back. I came back with an opinion, <laughs> and I got so owned. Let me tell you, <laughs> I feared for my life. No, I didn't really. But let me tell you. No, let me say something. What you get from that exchange is a check on you as an individual. You know, I work around this country from Stewart Island to Kaitaia. I'm booked two years solid. I'm doing a lot of public engagements, a fair bit of TV. Now, and unless we can get some feedback on that, you can end up in a very dangerous position where you think you know everything. And that's a dangerous position for anyone to fall into. So what you did there was give me something back to make me aware of who I am as well. And that's important that we do that for each other. You know, there's no question of that. So thank you very much. I want to talk about risk. And um, risk is part of life. But one of the things people are really concerned about with the online world is the amount of risk that's out there. Now, it occurs to me that just because there's risk out there doesn't mean that people are going to get hurt. And, and I know this because the kids and I have gotten into mountain biking in the last year or so, and that is like the risks are huge, but everyone's charging into it. Uh, do you think sometimes people worry too much about the risk of their kids being online? Or risk in general? Risk in general. Yeah, risk. Life's a risk, isn't it? You get out of bed in the morning and wonder what's going to happen for the day. But um, with four boys, I spent a large number of my time sitting in A&E. <laughs> I was nearly on first name basis. Because, and and I take partial responsibility for that because we grew up on a farm well, they grew up on a, I was raising them, we were on a farm, and I encouraged adventure um, in all sorts of aspects. We were reasonably limited, reasonably isolated, where the doctor and the mail came by boat, but we had, we had adventures, <laughs> like setting fire to rush bushes, like towing them behind um, the truck when the rain had made so, the paddock so wet and there was a toboggan on the back of the truck, and I'd turn corners so the back of it would swing out. My husband would say, hell, they might hit a fence or a rock or, or a piece of barbed wire or something. Well, they might. They might. And the, but they didn't. But as, as they grew up and as they became um, older, that, that was when they were young, but as they became older, they started taking their own risks. And that's when it became scary because I wasn't in control of that. And they were taking risks with alcohol, with parties, with that, all that whole thing. And that's terrifying, terrifying as a mother. And, and yet, that's life. And, and the lessons they learned in, in taking risks when they were younger ha, ha, put them in good stead when they were do, taking these adult, what they thought were adult risks, which were terrifying to me. And I, I don't think the digital platform is a lot different. There's risks, but I think there's a lot of wisdom coming from this corner of the room and the, well, from all corners here that... To you, even me? No, no, she didn't pick the yeah, centre. No, 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 it wasn't no the you're, you're not in a corner, yeah. you're in the middle. No, but um, <laughs> that, that, that it's a huge <laughs> issue because we are so fearful of what could happen and what... It, um, you know, um, people can take advantage, sure. and yeah. and 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 the huge pressure 
of marketing. I, I'm, I just, I, I don't like that. I think that needs to be addressed somehow. How children are um, marketed to. My, my, I've got a granddaughter who's three, and she said something about babies. Can I watch the babies? And I go, what? I don't do much. Uh, but apparently, there's a babies. Um, App where they teach these these sort of digitally created babies dance and sing and and it's quite engaging and they teach them colours and and shapes and all that sort of thing, and so I watched it to the end. What that was about that was advertising to babies, mm -hmm. that was full on advertising to a three year old child to buy this pony because it does does sparkles come out its bum or something, or, or this one will do something else. That was marketing to children, and yet m my, my son and his partner, who consider themselves enlightened parents, mm. who, and I don't disagree, they let her watch that. Mm. So that, that is interesting. So I think there's, there's, you've got too much concern about risk at one end, and not enough concern at all at the other. I don't, I don't think it's about risk and I think that's an oversimplification. I think that, you know, there's I my kids, um, you know, they'll go roly poly down the hill, they create things in garbage bags and, you know, they beat the crap out of each other, which I'm sure seems fun. Um, but when I was watching a um, YouTube video of Peppa Pig the other day for a split second it showed hardcore pornography and it had millions of views on YouTube and I thought it was a, a Peppa Pig show and somebody had obviously spliced a bit into it and I rung my sister and I was like I swear I think I'm going crazy but I just saw a dick in the middle of Peppa Pig and she was like I've read about this and she sent me this article that said that these programmers are spl splicing in hardcore porn into kids programming and then I went a bit deeper down the rabbit hole and found that they're actually replicating Peppa Pig and Paw Patrol and they're not from the creators of Peppa Pig and Paw Patrol mm. and I'm a parent who doesn't sit and watch Paw Patrol with their child or Peppa Pig with their child mm. like I'm sorry I know I should but mm. I don't <laughs> and so this was just a random time and I don't know how many dicks my six-year-old has seen or my four-year-old so you know I think that the risk is it's something other than risk. It's a new world that is terrifying and the worst things you can imagine are not as bad as what's on the internet. Mm. And this is the thing. Can you just, like my husband and I had a huge conversation about it, like YouTube is out, we only use Netflix, but we can afford, net well, we can't afford Netflix, but I get free Netflix. <laughs> but, um, you know, so not everybody has that. And so what are the options? Oh, we don't have a TV. We can't afford the, um, to get the... Our house is weird. Anyway, it's another story. Um, but, you know, there are different options for different people, and it's not all about choice. You know, we never had a TV until we had our second child because um, our second child was real, like, full on. <laughs> and our first one, we thought we were really good parents, but turns out we weren't. It was just he was an easy child. Um, <laughs> but, you know... <laughs> The point is that I'm not getting to my point very well. It's that it's really each day when you think, oh, I've, got, I've managed this thing. We're only going to use Netflix and we're going to keep an eye on it. And Netflix is a, you know, they have the children's section, you know. And then you just, it's a challenge the whole way through that. And then when I'm online, I only have a job because I'm online. So this idea that I'm like, oh, just going to go offline and we're going to go to the, go each morning out to the money tree and, you know, um, it's just not realistic. I have to be online for my job. My kids need to, I mean, I took them to chipmunks every day for like sometimes five hours a day to write my book, which means probably that I'm a bad parent, but they loved it. And they came out warriors from being in chipmunks that long. They have very good upper body strength. <laughs> so, but you know, what is the, the you know, it's a, I, I guess my point is, I don't know what the answer is. And I'm really, I'm going to get your book because I'd always avoided these books that say how to, you know, survive the apocalypse. Because I just thought they're just going to make me 
feel like I'm a ship here and, and that I'm doing everything wrong. And I just really like that the, this discussion. This discussion's been really surprising to me, and I'm into it. And Aren't I didn't go anywhere. Nelson? I did. I would have come anyway because I love Nelson, but I was kind of like this topic. I was like, oh, Seriously, gosh. Emily and Nelson, we sit around and have... We sit Sorry. around and have conversations like this all the time. Is this we're just Nelson? Very, yeah, You're totally. Just like, very Nelson you should come too. to Motawaika, mate. Yeah, and Motawaika <laughs> too. I love it. Yeah. Hey, uh, you got what, technology what you... there. We've got electricity. Oh, what, congratulations. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think about what you've just heard, Steve? Like, like... Oh, I, what I think is, I think that um, social media and technology is about amplification, actually. You know, if we think about something that amps something up, gives it more charge. So it's already there. But what it's so if there's deviance there, you're going to get more of it. If there's good there, you're going to get more good. And um, what it's doing is f facing, forcing into the light stuff that's always been hidden in the dark. So I believe the the age of the stale pale male in New Zealand is passing. Men, 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 Can't wait. <laughs> men with all men with all this control and power who who use it badly, and they're they're screwed. They really are. And um, good. Yeah, thank goodness. Yeah. But it, it's not going to come without a cost to, and a, and a big shake of the foundations of how our culture works. And um, yeah, it's just in a nutshell. Why is it good for me? Why is it good? Yeah, because I believe more love and compassion will see the light. Mm. That's why. Mm. And assholes like you know who who don't have that, don't allow that, and control it to be stymied will get um, called out. So a child today, we, the political system, in my opinion, at the moment, globally, in, in the countries that are hooked up, by the way, remember that most of the planet isn't hooked up. You know, we talk from this very privileged position here about the use of technology. There are some parts of the world where it's, they don't even get food or an iPad. So we've got to be careful about uh, you know, generalising. What I will say is this, that we globally, politically, we become very nationalistic you know, waving our own flags at the expense of other people's flags. That's, from a, that's the result of a hierarchy that wants to keep power. And I won't go too off track, but I will say this. Children are not being raised with that nationalistic outcome. They're being raised globally. They're being exposed to information across the whole planet. And that does inform them and shape them. That's why this change is going to be massive. When they start to vote... They will hold adults to account for their failures. You know, in the, in the high schools that I work in now, they come up to me, they talk about famine. Why haven't we solved that? We flew to the moon 70 years ago, six times, and we still have children on this planet that are starving to death. Do you know, every 4.7 minutes in this country, every hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year, every 4.7 minutes, the police are attending to an assault against a female in the home. Every 4.7 minutes, that's happening in this country. Every 12 months, nine babies are killed by adults in New Zealand. So there are risks out there, and there is harm out there. And we need to be careful not to not to focus on one particular part of the world in which we live, because then we solve a symptom. We don't cure a problem. So, so John, because this is part of the big picture and everything is connected, I have to jump in here because, <laughs> because before Emily passes out, because, because um, I, love the, I, love, I love what you said. I totally love what you said, but I just want to say a couple of things. One is, uh, yes, every four and a half minutes or whatever it is, someone has been called to a house because of violence, Right. I would say 30 years ago, just as much violence was going on, but no one was calling the police because people didn't get involved. So that, that is one thing that has changed, which is good. Um, I love the idea that the world's going to change when young people vote, but I'm a politician who's trying to get young people to vote, and most of them aren't very interested. And do you know where they're really, really not interested? The United States of America. And that is a crisis. So if, uh, I love the idea, but how are we going to get young people to vote? Stop labelling them. Stop labelling them. Okay. Start, start, no, start talking to them. You know, when an adult walks into a school and stands in front of 2,000 students and say, you've got to stop bullying, that's absurd. That's an absurd... They should talk to them, not, not, not speak at them, not give them pamphlets and posters. Connect with them. 
you know, when I first came to this country 25 years ago, I'd never experienced this before. Uh, we were going to a wedding. They said, but don't bring your children. I'd never heard that in my life before. I thought, well, is this, have they got some skin disease that they'll pass on to the bride or something? I, I wasn't sure what that was about. We, we have created a division between us and them. And that's what we've got to get rid of. Stop judging them so much for their failures. The prisons are full of adults. What's their excuse? They've got a complete brain. You know, but we, we are continually judging them. We need to celebrate them more. If I had my way, I'd take every poster down in a school that talked about bullying and celebrate their successes. I see research that says one in five school children bully each other. That means four out of five don't. But we don't celebrate that. And I think we need to be much more positive about the world in which they live. Look at the world they live in. Look at the kind of information they've got access to. It is now important more than ever that we celebrate them as individuals and we celebrate their existence, not keep criticising them. So I just want to, Anne had an interesting uh, take on the uh, story about the wedding, which uh, we are on a bit of a tangent, but everything's connected. So Anne, what are your thoughts on the wedding? Well, my thought was, uh, and still is, that um, John had a choice there. He gets an invitation to a event which the host has decided how they want it. They're paying, presumably. John has a choice to go, oh, my children can't go. That means then I'm not going. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks very much. Have a great time. And no problem. No judgment on the people having the wedding. I mean, if someone has a party and says, come dressed as a dragon, you, you don't have to go. You're yeah. invited. I have yeah. a view on this and because having a party where someone dresses as a dragon, there isn't this movement to have everybody dressing as dragons and that's not adding into that. Every time we say no kids, that, I mean, don't have a kid at your wedding, that's fine. I'll just go, oh yeah, that person's a dickhead and I won't talk to you again, fine. But the thing is, if you're going to start with weddings and, you know, like, I think that's such a micro thing, it's such a tiny personal decision. But when we have... Then we have birthday parties and cafes and places in public. I've taken my kids to the museum and had people shush them at the museum in the kids section. Like, you know, yes, you yes, can but go then you have a choice. Ads. No, but yeah. I don't no, have no, the no, you same have a choice as you do. And you don't have the same choice as she does or she does or he does or he does. No, because no. I know what it's like when I was a new mum with a child who was in the intensive care unit and I almost lost him. And it was the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my, my entire life. My child was born not being able to breathe. It was the exact opposite of what being a mother should have been. And all that that taught me is that that feeling can almost kill you. That feeling of not having anything else, nobody to help you. You're completely alone, holding the hand of your child who can't breathe and is being breathed for by a machine. And I made a decision after that, that, dear God, if I ever got through this, and I literally pray prayed to like every God, even the tambourine one, you know, I was like, if I get through this, I will do anything that I can to make sure no mother knows what it has to feel like this, this agony of being all on your own. And so when he got through it, and it took multiple surgeries before he even turned one to be able to start to breathe properly, I said I'd do that. And now he's six years old, and every day I meet mothers saying to me, I want to die. I'm so lonely. I want to die. And if anybody thinks that isn't true, I will sit down with you and I will show you all the mothers doing that. I've got 35,000 odd mothers who say to me, I don't know how to be a good mum, I'm terrified. And they're so lonely. And so these choices of, oh, I'm just not going to have kids in this cafe or at this party, or I'm going to have a family event that celebrates love, and I'm not going to have children there. Do, the, do whatever the fuck you want, but don't think that the, your personal choice isn't political. It is absolutely political, and it absolutely adds up. So isn't it a great thing that... Yeah, thanks for applause. Isn't it, isn't it a great thing that um, the technology exists for you to connect with those mothers? Can I just say something to that? It does, but you've, that's, you're talking about a quality of opportunity. And not every mother and every father, by the way, has an opportunity to buy an iPad or a computer for their own child. We don't live in that world. 
You know, I travel this country and go through schools where schools are fully fitted out with the best technology in the world. And then I go to other schools where they're trying to save $200 to get a hole fixed in their roof. So and until you've got a quality of opportunity, you can't have that conversation. Absolutely. You can't. And we've cut funding across the board to places like Plunkett. There's no Plunkett in neighbourhood like there used to be. I, I volunteered for Plunkett for two years until they just got rid of the Plunkett on the south coast in Wellington. Just got rid of it. There's no places for people to just go in and see, just be with other parents. The coffee groups, you're going to go to a cafe and then risk them, that cafe owner then taking your photo and putting it on Facebook and saying your child cried the whole time and it upset the other people in the cafe. You know, like this is, there are not the same programs and things in place because of P&D Wellington, I'm doing a fundraising for them. Um, where I've just said to them, I will fundraise as much as I can. They have one person with anxiety running that whole thing. You know, the, the postnatal depression groups are run by women with postnatal depression, <laughs> with no government funding, with nothing. P&D Canterbury have one person running them with nothing else. You know, and these mothers don't necessarily, they can't get online, or that I worry about the ones who don't have the access to technology or are too anxious to be able to reach out and there's no programs in place. There's nobody knocking on the door saying, hey, I, I noticed you had a baby. Can I've bought you some meals. So we should ask the politician. Hey, why aren't, yeah. why aren't, well, um, I'll tell you, know. you what, you want the answer. You asked, uh, hey, you asked, hey? you asked. Well, why aren't, if you, want, <laughs> if you want to actually support all the things that you're hearing about right now, I'm just gonna put it out there. Vote green, seriously, I'm not kidding. Thank you. There you go. No. So, I'm, well, since you asked, I, um, but 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 it does. It is important that it all does come down to politics, and that we recognise that. And you do have choices at elections, and you can look at manifestos, and you can decide. And one of the lines that that I love is vote your values. So think about that next year, because there's an election locally next year, and think about that in 2020. We're going to take some questions from the floor. Um. We are recording, so um, that's why we want the mic. And please, a question, not a statement. And Nadia, I'm coming right to you. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a really, um, really fascinating talk um, with parents to young children. And it's really good to hear other people's views all the time to add to the bombardment of information that you're always getting as parents. But um, John, it was really great to hear your take on the big picture because I believe that everything is linked and I'm very passionate too about that. You can hear it in my voice. Um, and, but um, what I, I con I'm concerned about is what I see in the smaller picture every day. We're in a low socioeconomic area and we see a lot of TV used in kindy and schools and how do you... What do, what's your, what are all of your views on um, using um, an iPad as a um, calming device for um, two and three year olds um, trying to settle into kindy or using it at school, using screen time at school? The question for me, is that for me, is the question? All of you if you have time. Well, you. very quickly I'd say that um, your question sort of skipped from calming a child down. All behaviours that, that might appear outside of normalcy are conveying something that might need further investigation. So if a child is moving into a new environment that's, that's new to them, then of course they're getting all of these visual stresses coming in and they react to that. And if we simply put a device in front of them, maybe that fixes it. Um, but the question then becomes if they go somewhere else and they get stimulus that makes them stressed, do we give them the device then? I, I think that... Um, in the kindergartens, it's important that they are moving, interacting with other people, being involved in the world in which they live. Um, but that's not criticising technology. That's about the environment in which they're in at that particular age. Um, I've got no problem with technology being used in the education sector. It is simply a tool to deliver resource. We have to remember that it's not the device we're interested in, it's what we receive. And in the same way, if we eat too much junk food, things go wrong, right? But if we reduce the junk food and eat more healthy, then we tend, up in a we tend to be in a better position. 
Well, it's the same with technology. What are we, what's coming into our brain? Is it junk? If it's junk, it will affect our vocabulary and it will affect our relationships. But if it's empowering, if it's talking about human rights, if it's talking about this global world in which we live, I think that's fantastic based on that age and level of maturity. I think um, in those situations, children need all the support that they can be given to learn strategies for themselves, to soothe themselves in an overwhelming situation. An iPad might be available, but it might not be charged. Or, um, you know, you reach for that and it's not working or, or it's not there. What do you do when you're on your own and in the car because mum's shot into the supermarket to grab something? and you're sitting there in your car seat and can't go anywhere and a dog barks. You need some way to, to help yourself so soothe your own anxiety. Self-soothe. Yeah, there's a term. But we can help. We can acknowledge you're feeling vulnerable. You're feeling frightened. It's okay to feel that. You're human. It's okay to feel that way. You don't have to avoid... The, the variety of feelings that we have as humans. It's okay to feel all of it. Um, so the, my children are in kindy. My um, just turned six-year-old is obviously at school now. But um, So the kindy teachers bring in toilet paper from home. Um, they bring in um, pens, paper from home. We try and salvage scraps. Um, of material and stuff like that for the, from the dump to bring in. Um, kindies are completely underfunded. My kindy couldn't afford an iPad if they wanted to, um, and they certainly couldn't afford um, the extra stuff. So I guess I would say that if you live in a socio low socioeconomic and you're concerned about that, my um, advice would be to contact some bars and restaurants around the city, explain to them um, what the budget is for your kindy, ask if they would allow you to have a night um, in their venue for free, and then I would encourage you to send me a message and I'll share it with my community and get as many parents as you can into the space, do a sliding scale cost of 10 to $25 depending what people can afford, and then donate a couple of tickets as well chuck on a Spotify playlist, call it a mum night out. And um, I just did that, right, um, sold 120 tickets in about a week and raised two grand for P&D Wellington. Do a fundraiser, give them money so they can do something, do something tangible. And, also, and I just want to add, I don't believe that a kindergarten that doesn't have technology is any worse off than a kindergarten that does. We've got to be really careful with that. We start to give too much power to that device. Yeah in a young person's hands, you know, that's But I important. would say that there are a lot of um, pla places that um, could cope up and other places that are really bones of their ass in terms of that. And actually, you know what, an iPad or a TV is something in that case being bought by a parent into the thing because they've got all these children and if all resources they've got, they don't have the outdoor space because maybe it's not safe out there anymore because a new fence needs to be built. You know, a really healthy, vibrant kindy is a kindy with resources and a place like that doesn't need um, these, often a TV at um, a Kuta Kaupapa or a kindy or any other place, a crash, community crash, it's very common. It's because they don't have other resources. So sometimes parking the kids in front of the TV um, is going to save them because they've got two teachers for 40 kids because of the child-teacher ratio. And, and the, on that regard, you should look up NZIE and look at what you can do um, politically to make sure there are enough teachers so kids don't need to be put in front of a TV or be given an iPad. The times that I've seen that happen is because of resources. Okay, um, time for one more question. I'm Sorry, afraid. I talked over you. Couldn't, couldn't get to... Thank you very much. This has been a very stimulating conversation. We have rules and regulations and laws in our land to, if not prevent the dark side of our behavior, at least to say there are consequences and to try to make those consequences uh, commens commensurate with the, the behavior. The internet is a free zone, it appears. And I'm concerned that those things, those dark sides are out there and they are very accessible to everybody. 
and particularly to children who don't have the wherewithal to say, oh, as you said, John, this is junk stuff. I must avoid looking at this kind of stuff because it'll cause addiction. It'll cause all sorts of grief. It'll make me unable to live uh, adequately uh, or, or, or live at all. I knew a young man. He was, he was 20. He had got so deep into games, the, not the games where you just play with yourself, you know, with the computer, but games where you're playing in teams, and these team members are all over the world, and they're, they're playing war-like games. He, was, he did that 18 hours a day. He couldn't feed himself. He couldn't k take care of himself. He needed a caregiver. Um, really serious stuff. Uh, so the question is, just that was background. The question is, uh, what do we do with the internet? Do we consider it a, a uh, free speech, or do we consider it something that should be highly regulated? I guess, just coming back to one thing there, we, um, you have these things called parental controls, right? You, know, these, you can put software on your devices to curb out certain types of information the child may access, right? And there's nothing wrong with using parental controls based on their age and level of maturity. There's nothing wrong with that. We've done that before technology existed. We make sure that if we're in, an, we don't take children generally to violent pornographic environments. We raise them with love and kindness and nurture. We protect them based on their age and level of maturity. But I will say this, don't try and sanitize the world. Can you imagine raising a child to the age of 18 that they haven't seen a person drunk? And then when they go off to university and they come home after term one, They'll say, I saw these people on a Saturday night vomiting. What was wrong with them, mom or dad? Was it a virus? You know, they need to understand the world in which they live. But I will say this to you. This is important. To develop open lines of communication with your children. Open lines of communication so they can come and tell you anything that worries them or bothers them. One of the biggest barriers for a child to come to mom and dad is their overreaction when they've done things wrong. They learn not to talk to us. And that's the danger. Because... The boy or the girl then that is exposed to something that's unacceptable or they know is not good, they put it into their head, they go to bed and they can't get to sleep and they bury it deep down. And if that keeps happening, by the time they get to 15 and 16, they've got these general anxieties and they can't sleep and they start to feel depressed. Now that's a simplification of the issue. But we need to develop open lines of communication with our children, not based on judgment, based on love. Non-judgmental parenting will raise a child to become whole. And this will happen. When they are exposed to something that's unacceptable, they'll come back and they'll go, look, I saw this, what do you think? And when we give them a hug and we go, it's okay, you're going to be fine, that's the key. That's the world in which they live. But if they're loved every day, if they're hugged every day, if they're nurtured, if they're given food and shelter, that makes them strong to work in this world. It's as simple as that. So don't panic about what's out there, raise the child to cope with it. Sure, yeah. If you've got any questions, we're going to stick around for a bit afterwards. So, and, yeah, yeah. Sleep was the one we left out. And sleep. Get lots of sleep. Sleep. The World Health Authority have just said, the World Health Authority has just told us that lack of sleep is a major problem for our health. Children, I'm seeing children that are ten, uh, six and seven years of age. <laughs> Sorry, new that, parents. Six yeah, and yeah, seven. Totally. That, that can't, um, <laughs> for the parents, okay. But the children. <laughs> six and seven years of age that are being put in the, uh, in, into, the, uh, into a room at school to go to sleep because they haven't had enough sleep. You know, we are the only species on the planet that deliberately avoids sleep. Deliberately avoid it. But this, <laughs> this, is, a, no, but this is a good point because <laughs> so how true. are parents, expect, how are, is a mother expected to raise a child with love and compassion if she's sleep deprived to such an extent? And that's where it is a bigger issue, a governmental issue and a society issue. How can we support young mothers in a way that enables them to um, parent with love and compassion? It's, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a huge issue. We expect them Sorry. to do it on two hours sleep. And I'm just going to chuck in here, uh, and I know I'm sitting close to Emily and I'm, with, I'm, I'm within range, but, but actually I have to say as a hands-on parent myself, 
um, who shared very much in the entire process of little little babies and so on. Um, it also applies. That it all to applies men. to yeah. men as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, men have to get up during the night. They have to be doing just as many wake up. I mean, I'm yeah. amazed at the mums I meet whose partners will say, "I have to work in the morning." Like she's not working. Like, excuse yeah. me, one of you has a harder job than the other one. Thank you very much. And I. Totally agree. I'm so glad you brought up how men have to step up their game and actually be getting up during the night. It's very guess, important. Guess what, Emily? <laughs> I got up I know. All the time. I and know. it's great. And it's I the tell, only way I, I tell, survived but with I seriously, my husband I tell doing other, that. Uh, new great. dads. I always have this conversation yeah. with them. I encourage them to do it. And I just had one the other day, and this guy said, he literally just, things were going so well. And he said, well, you know, I've got to work. And I thought, mm, mate. Anyway, let's uh, leave it there. We've got lots of, you can continue these conversations um, uh, after we've closed the main thing. Come to the book signing. Of course, this has been brought to you by Page and Blackmore Booksellers. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> Woohoo! I, I do want a quick, quick last word, if we could go around the panel just quickly. Just a, a last thought from you, Steve. Generally, parenting, the whole thing, what have you made of this conversation? Oh, I think there's a whole lot of narrative gets wound up into doing the wrong thing yep. as opposed to doing what is the right thing. And I think you al there's always a choice to act with love. Yeah, nice. That's Emily? my view. Yeah, I love that. And um, yeah, I just, I don't have much to add. It's been very nice. I wasn't expecting <laughs> it to be such a great conversation. <laughs> and I'm, I'm very grateful and a little bit in love and, you know, just going to be outside your window like, <sighs> I'm, mar I'm, <laughs> hey, um, I'm, I'm married. Oh, yeah. Oh. So, but you're very nice. <laughs> and I think Emily made a really good point that, that uh, raising children is work, actually. And, and what we've done is um, if, we, if there's a mother and a child or a father and a child and we put the child over here in childcare, and the mother over here in work, they become um, economic, uh, they generate economic activity. If a child's in a childcare centre, it does. And if a mother's in work, you put them together in the home and she's doing a sterling job with love and compassion and with maybe support from her community. She doesn't generate any, uh, she's not, she doesn't show on the um, GDP, on the, on the e economy. And that's wrong. There's something fundamentally wrong in that. If we separate, um, oh. separate them. So, so, so it's important. I don't know what the answer is, but I do there's think you something. should recognise on the GDP, but also mums who have kids in childcare as well are doing an amazing job, yep. and it's really difficult. And I really yeah. And here's some good news: the new government, as part of its co part of the confidence and supply agreement with the Green Party, is working on. New Zealand having a whole new set of measures by which we value health and success other than GDP. And next year will be the first year we actually use those stats, which is a great thing. John, final word. Uh, very quick, two very quick things, if I could. Number one is stop putting the burden of raising a child onto a teacher in a school. Teachers only have students 11% of the time. The rest of the time, they're somewhere else. Um, the next thing I'll say is change our language to describe their behaviours. Don't call yourself a digital parent. You're a parent living in a digital age. That, that's a different way of looking at it. Um, raise them to speak for themselves, to advocate for themselves and for others. Teach them about the importance of human rights. And I'll leave you with this challenge, or I'll leave you with a question, but I don't want you to answer it. When was the last time you looked into your child's eyes, really looked into their eyes, and told them how much you love them? It's the connection we have with them that's important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Aww. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, John Parsons, <laughs> Emily Wright, Steve Henry, and Anne Harvey. I've been Matt Laurie. Thank you very much for coming, um, and please stick around. And Kerry, thank you very much for putting us together on the stage. Thanks very much.